In our many lectures to this point, we've discussed the creation of all things and their cor corruption by sin. We've also learned that God was not surprised by humankind's decision to disobey. We dis discussed the idea that he had a plan set in place before the foundation of the world, whereby he would re redeem humanity. He set out to buy us back from our state of brokenness. We concluded that the central elements in God's redemptive plan were Jesus Christ and his blood. The broader subject for today's lecture is salvation. In Exodus 6, we learn of God's work of salvation as directed towards the Israelites. They had been enslaved in Egypt and were oppressed severely. God had compassion on them, and then he initiated a plan to deliver them or to save them from their terrible situation. His plan involved sending Moses to take the people out of their bondage. But his plan also involved bringing his people into the promised land. God's initiative and power are key aspects of Egypt's, or rather Israel's, salvation. In Christ, God has responded compassionately to the bondage of all humankind to our state of sinfulness. In Christ, God is delivering us out of bondage and into a state of new life, freedom. Salvation, then, according to Millard Erickson, is the application of the work of Christ to the life of the individual. Gordon Smith also notes, salvation is God's work and God's work alone, unequivocally. God saves. There is no such thing as self-salvation. The salvation and transformation that we seek must come wholly from the hands of God. Salvation, then, is completely the work of God. But salvation does call for and necessitate a response from human beings. The Egyptians, or rather the Israelites, deliverance from, from Egypt was not a result of their resources and planning, but their response of obedience uh, that was necessary. When defining the core elements of salvation, then, several models have proven helpful. In the following moments, I'd like to present three key models, and many have used these models as a means of helping uh, articulate God's plan of salvation to others, and they're sometimes used as a kind of uh, witnessing tool. The first model that we'll be discussing is the idea of the Romans road. Uh, this model draws upon five key teachings from the book of Romans to outline the truths of salvation. First of all, Romans points to the fact of sin. So we read in Romans 3.10, no one is good, not even one. And in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans, we also read about the result of sin. So in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We also see in Romans uh, teaching about the penalty that has been paid. And so in Romans 5, 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And then we see that the payment has to be accepted. So Christ has paid the, the penalty for us, but we need to respond to it. And in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, we read, For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. It's by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. And fifthly, we see here um, that acceptance of that payment brings us into a relationship of sonship. And so in Romans 8, uh, verses 15 and 16, or sometimes uh, people will divert to other passages like John 1, 12, or 1 John 5, 11 through 13 here. But we read uh, in Romans 8, So you should not be like cowering, fearful slaves. You should behave instead like God's very own children, adopted into his family, calling him Father, dear Father. For his Holy Spirit speaks to us in our hearts and tells us that we're God's children. The second model that I want to look at briefly here is the bridge illustration. And the bridge illustration is an effective means of sharing the story of salvation because it's graphic. Uh, but it, it does take a little while if you're going to share this with someone. Uh, another advantage of this model is that after drawing the picture, uh, you can give it to someone and they can take it with them. So the key points here are, first of all, uh, the Bible teaches that God loves all and he wants all people uh, to know him. Secondly, uh, 
the problem is, however, that man is, or humankind, is separated from God and his love. And so we see a, a big chasm here. We see that on the one side there is God, and we see, know that his standard uh, is that we be perfect, as he is perfect, as it's recorded in Matthew 8. On the other hand, we've already learned in Romans 3 that, that humans are sinful. And so this creates a separation between uh, us and God. So the result of our sin is separation. Uh, the wages of sin is death. Hebrews 9 tells us that we are all destined to die. We're appointed to die and face the judgment because of the separation we experience from God. Sometimes, uh, unfortunately, we try to bridge this chasm through our own effort. And the truth is that there's nothing we can do in our own effort to bridge this gap. Instead, we see in Ephesians 2, uh, God saved you by his special favor when you believed. You can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. None of us can boast about it. So we can't bridge the gap through our good deeds, or our religious practices, or anything that we might try to do in that regard. It's a free gift from God. And that free gift comes to us through Jesus Christ. So we see here uh, in this illustration that Jesus bridges the gap between humans and God. In Romans 5, 8, we read, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we're still sinners. In 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6, it says, This is, this is good and pleases God our Savior, for he wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and people. He is the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And in 1 Peter 3.18, we read, Christ also suffered when he died for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners, that he might bring us safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. And then we see here that even though Christ has bridged the gap for us, it's necessary for humans to respond. And so uh, we see in John uh, 112, but all who believed in him and accepted him have the right to become children of God. Again, in John 5, 24, I assure you, those who listen to my message and believe in the God who sent me will have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins. They've already passed from death unto life. So human response uh, in belief and trust is important. The third model uh, that I want to look at is actually Paul's own summary of the gospel message. And we read this in 1 Corinthians 15. He's actually speaking about the future resurrection. And he summarizes here uh, the key of the gospel message. Uh, now let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news, the gospel that I preached to you before. As it is this good news that saves you if you firmly believe it. I pa pass on to you what's most important, what has also been passed on to me that Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, as the scripture said. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me. So we see here his kind of basic outline of the gospel. And there are four important points, I think, that emerge from Paul's summary here. First of all, is the idea that belief is an important response to the truth of the gospel. Secondly, the truth of the gospel is passed on both through people and through written scripture. Thirdly, Jesus' death on our behalf for our sin is a key component. The importance of this, his physical death, is emphasized here in stating that he was buried. Fourthly, that Jesus rose from the dead is, is also central to the gospel. He was buried, so his death was real, but he came back to life, and Paul cites a number of people who saw him, including himself. Because Christ conquered death, we have hope that, that his forgiveness is real and that we have a great future uh, waiting ahead. And finally, Paul says that the gospel changes us. When we respond to the powerful Christ, uh, he works his grace and power in our lives to change us into new creatures. Uh, when we look at Jesus' life and ministry and his preaching, we see a, a less formulaic definition of salvation. In fact, salvation or, or deliverance is not his normal terminology for speaking of God's work in someone's life. Instead, Jesus again and again speaks of the gospel 
uh, in terms of the gospel of the kingdom of God. This gospel impacted people on a variety of levels and calls for a variety of responses. So when Jesus speaks of gospel, he's, he's using a term that literally means good news. It's from the Greek word uh, euangelion, and from which we get our word evangelism. Jesus' message is about the kingdom of God. Simply stated, the kingdom of God is the reign of God. So in Luke 4, 43, Jesus says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other places too, because that's why I was sent. Jesus came to bring hope to a people in need of physical, spiritual, and psychological care. As such, Jesus came not only talking about his kingdom, but he came to unleash the power of his kingdom. And so we read in Matthew 9, 35, Jesus traveled through all the cities and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news of the kingdom. And wherever he went, he healed people of every sort of disease and illness. Jesus' good news of the kingdom also brought conflict. So wherever the truth encounters injustice, there's conflict. Jesus didn't try to avoid conflict. Bringing the kingdom to men generated a high level of backlash from spiritual, religious, and political powers around him, and he did not avoid that. Ultimately, we learn that, that Jesus brought the kingdom to humankind, but the kingdom is not now revealed in its completeness. Sometimes, then, we refer uh, to this dynamic by saying that the kingdom is already, but not yet. So the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus talked about, this kingdom uh, will be ultimately set up at his second coming. In the meantime, we follow Jesus as his disciples, carrying out the work of the kingdom and preaching the good news that Jesus brought to humanity. And, and we, we know that that um, the power and influence of the kingdom breaks through into our current reality and circumstances, but we look ahead to the time when it will be perfectly expressed and sin and disease and power mongering will be destroyed completely. In a very helpful book uh, by Bryant Myers called Walking with the Poor, he outlines then the different um, elements of the kingdom of God and how that uh, relates to ministry. And so he presents the kingdom of God as a, a kind of holistic representation. So we see it clearly in Jesus's own ministry. And we see the idea that the kingdom of God involves uh, being with Christ or having a spiritual life connection to him personally. Uh, we see that it involves proclamation of the gospel as a word. We see that it involves deeds or a demonstration of the gospel in terms of healing uh, and spiritual warfare. And then we also see it as a kind of um, demonstrated in terms of signs. And so we see Jesus uh, engaging again in spiritual warfare, performing miracles and such. And so uh, the understanding of the gospel of kingdom as represented in Christ's ministry, as um, presented in the gospels, is truly a, a kind of holistic idea. And we need to wrestle with what does that mean for our own lives and ministries and circumstances in the Christian world? That our, this gospel is not simply something that is personal and individual. It's not something that's simply proclaimed. What does it mean for us to also demonstrate that gospel in our communities? And then ultimately, uh, I wanted to comment here about the response to the kingdom message. So Jesus brought the message of the kingdom of God to all people, and he called them to respond in many ways. We should note, however, that, that Jesus maintained a special place in his ministry for the poor and abandoned. And we can look at Luke 4 for that. The kingdom brings the greatest hope to those who are the most vulnerable. The kingdom is also for, for children, for women, for lepers, for non-Jews. It has no boundaries. There are two key responses to the kingdom message. First of all, the idea of faith. And this is the, the dominant theme in John and in the other Gospels. And there's this idea of following. So follow me is often Jesus' call. To be his disciple is literally to be a follower of him or a learner 
from him. And then Jesus also called people to respond at, spe at specific points of allegiance. So the first disciples were called to, to leave their uh, professions, to leave their nets, their fishing nets, in order to follow Christ. An unnamed disciple is challenged immediately to follow Christ and to let the dead bury the dead in Matthew 8. To a rich young ruler who is, who is uh, asking about the way of salvation, Jesus tells him, go and sell all that you have and give your money to the poor and come and follow him in Matthew 19. To a Samaritan woman, Jesus reaches out to her in power, through prophecy and in truth by speaking of spiritual water and he calls her to a simple response of faith in John chapter 4. And to a Roman officer who expresses faith in, in Jesus' ability to heal, Jesus extends deliverance. His faith was enough. And Jesus said it was actually more than that of the others. And so what I want to express here is that the response to the kingdom message is diverse. And Jesus comes to each of us at the point of our heart need and, and challenges us to respond in faith or to respond in some tangible way that will cause us to express our turn from ourselves to complete allegiance to him. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ.